Hello, everyone. Uh, also, welcome. We have a guest from UVA today with us. Uh, so, welcome. Also, we have a bunch of other 42 campuses joining us today, online, of course. So, welcome to everyone who decided to join us for that masterclass. Today, we're uh, hosting Alessandro, who will tell you all about cloud native for uh, developers. So, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Please give it up for Alessandro. <laughs> All right, thank you for having me. Uh, so thank you for uh, organizing this. So I'm um, technically a Coda mentor because I really like to talk about these things, right? So uh, you're gonna see in a moment why I really, it's my role, it's my, not my job, but one, one thing that I'm very proud of and something that I do with passion is to talk about technology. Um, and so when I talk to people at Coda, so I'm very excited to be here and, uh, and to continue talking to you. So please, after this, reach out to me. I can't stop talking and uh, coding about cloud native. So and organizing this kind of meetups and uh, events. So who knows what cloud native is already? Zero. Great, you are in the right place to, to learn a thing or two about cloud native technologies. So, uh, let's start. So, uh, not sure how long it's gonna take, so please interrupt me because the cloud native and Kubernetes and containers, all these topics, they are, of course, I, I will talk about it, the history, the background, what they are and how they work, but it's really something that you do hands on. So if you want, I can just fire up some containers. We can start see things in action, which is even better than, uh, than uh, just a bunch of slides. So I'm gonna talk about myself, of course, why I'm doing this, why I'm here, what is cloud native computing, uh, which is the topic of the day, and what is behind all this movement, so the foundation. So I will talk a lot about open source. Uh, so please bear with me, I'm an open source zealot. I mean, I really, really like open source. I think it's the best thing ever. So there is a, there is a reason why cloud native has such strong roots in open source. So I will talk about that as well. I will give you some tips how to start. Like uh, you, uh, you wanna be cloud native, that's, uh, that's the way to go. And how to, to get started and then some prep up and see where it goes. So about me, so I'm Italian, I'm 47. I got married last Saturday, so I'm freshly, thank you. Unfortunately, my, my wife is also a student. She's learning JavaScript, she's, she's learning a bunch of technologies as well, cloud native things and Kubernetes. So I, I feel very close to you because I spend a lot of time with her, of course, because she's my lovely wife, but also, you know, teaching them, teaching her uh, about all these things. So I, I'm here because I am an ambassador for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that's uh, my institutional role. I don't get paid for it. I just get a nice badge and, uh, and free tickets to the conferences. But in general, like, it's an honorary title for people around the world that really like to spread the word about Cloud Native Computing. And so because I organize the local meetups, I'm an ambassador, so it's, it's my pleasure to talk about this, these things. Uh, I work in a small company, uh, 200 people, called Solo.io. We do service mesh, which is kind of an add-on to Kubernetes, so I'll talk about it in a separate talk, maybe. Uh, I have my own company, so Lovelace Engineering, in memory of Ada Lovelace. I hope everybody knows who Ada Lovelace is. So I have a small consulting business where I do trainings and consulting, but uh, mostly I organize these events called Kubernetes Community Days. And of course, I come from these places. Uh, spent some time in Microsoft, I know. For people that love open source, that, could, that was a... Uh, contradiction, but actually not really, because Microsoft does a, lot of, uh, does a lot of open source. And I come from Red Hat, which is the mecca of open source in a way. So I suggest you, if you are into open source and Java, Red Hat is the place to be. I came to Amsterdam to get my PhD in chemistry uh, from the University of Amsterdam, so I have a scientific background. And I'm a party guy because at some point I was working for id &T. the guys who organized this party. So I'm also an amateur DJ. We, me and my friends, we organize raves in Amsterdam and parties, so there's more behind the, the 
the first layer of geek and nerd is also a party guy, which is actually not a contradiction at all. So I suggest if you like to party also, this is the, the, the place to be. And come talk to me if you like techno and minimal. So cloud native, right? So everybody's talking about it. There's a lot of confusion. There's the uh, official definition from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, right? So who better than the foundation could give you some advice on what it is? And it's still, even if I tell you, it's probably gonna take some time before it uh, sediments in your brain and uh, understand what it is. It's nothing really magic or, or something special. And it's not even something particularly related to the cloud. You can do cloud native application development using on-premise infrastructure, nothing stops you from doing that. The real crux of the cloud native principles are, of course, containers. And I'm gonna talk about what a container is. If you don't know what Docker is or containers, don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll spend uh, 20, 25 minutes on it. So containers, containers orchestration, which is Kubernetes, of course, like uh, it's not the only orchestrator out there, was not the only for a long time, now definitely is the one that kind of won the cloud orchestra, the container orchestration wars, and now we, are, we live in this post-war uh, era where everything is Kubernetes and now we just uh, enjoy a single platform to orchestrate containers. And the other things are microservices. If you, <coughs> If you're a developer and uh, you probably have encountered the, the ideas behind the 12 uh, factor apps, the 12 factor uh, uh, way of building applications. So microservices is, in, is integral to the idea of cloud native uh, applications. And if you know what it is, is there are a bunch of very prescriptive rules to build a microservice application. And when you do that, when you find, when you face this, uh, this uh, dilemma of building an application like that, then you also need this kind of things. So when you build a microservice application, you probably want to use containers. And once you start using containers, you grow into your usage of containers and eventually you hit some, some limit. It works on my machine, but now I need to deploy it on dozens of machines and need to scale, then that's where you uh, find orchestration a necessity and a solution in, Kuber in Kubernetes. So that's very simple in, in a way. It's everything, application built according to these principles, we call them cloud native applications. That's uh, no more than that. It's nothing magic or, uh, but this represents like a big chunk of the current market big opportunities for you to learn uh, and definitely to find a job in the cloud native world, right? So it's where, it's my industry where I thrive and, uh, and work and I really enjoy the community behind it because behind all this, there's a, of course like a lot of open source developers, lots of companies making good profit out of it and of course also people, right? So behind this, ideas, there's people like me organizing meetups, organizing uh, user groups and so on. So, now, containers. So what happened that we are talking about containers in 2023, and when did, then when did we start, and why it started at the time it started? So, this is the classic representation of what a container is. Right? So you start from the left, and this is your traditional deployment. You have an application, Application is code, right? So you got the bunch of code. Is either a language that you need to compile or not compile, doesn't really matter. But in the end, it's an app that runs on top of an operating system. Most likely Linux, right? So it doesn't matter, really, it could be Windows, but 98% of applications today are built for, run on the Linux kernel, right? So the Linux kernel is this abstraction over hardware, so <coughs> it's the thing that sits on top of, of your machine, boots up, and magically all your RAM, CPU, USB ports are available to your application, right? So, so the application really relies on the Linux kernel to run. 
the operating system includes, of course, the kernel and the user space stuff that, that makes an a operating system, right? So if, I hope that you, especially if you learn C++, I guess Linux is your bread and butter, so you know this, this thing called the kernel, which is this magic place where things go fast and uh, everything is written in, uh, in C++, of course, and uh, it's, just, it's the gatekeeper of everything about a host, a machine, and everything on top is the user space. So it's, I don't know, 1996, 1998, 2000, that's how you deploy stuff, right? So you compile your, your application, you put all your uh, dependencies in the operating system, and you run the application on top of, of the Linux kernel. Great, it works, just not really flexible. The application conflict to each other, they need different libraries, different stuff, so that's, that's it works, but it's painful. And the more computing we use, the more we adopt computing everywhere. You imagine it's 2000, there's internet, there's things online now. People started to, to cram a lot of uh, application into one host. That's where virtual machine, virtualization came along and made VMware billions. Right, so this is uh, around 2000, the, the early 2000 VMware, but of course like VMware was just, was just the tip of the spear. Uh, there are other virtualization technology, also open source like KVM. By the way, Amazon Web Services built on KVM. So the whole cloud thing really started with this model. So AWS took KVM, the open source project, put on a bunch of servers, start selling the extra capacity, and that's where the cloud was born. So virtual machines are great because they offer perfect isolation between your application, right? So application on this VM can't even see what's going on in a VM running in the same host just next door, but completely isolated because you virtualize the whole operating system, the whole resources and everything. It works great. You need an hypervisor, KVM, uh, VMware, whatever. Uh, it just, it's a bit resource hungry, right? So you need to duplicate a lot of stuff. These libraries, operating systems, they're literally duplicated, right? So the, the, you have to run them several times as many VMs you need. It's okay, just uh, it's a bit wasteful. And waste is, is the enemy, right? So uh, especially, so, where all this started to, you know, didn't really fit the bill uh, was with hosting providers. Because of course, like, uh, they want to squeeze as much as possible in terms of literal revenue out of a single host. If they buy 10 machines and they can cram 300 customers on them instead of 350, they lose a bit of money, right? So, so literally, this was initiated, this container revolution by hosting providers, right? So because they just wanted to have a more efficient way to use resources. So what if, instead of an hypervisor, you use directly the Linux ker the kernel of your host and you just virtualize or separate just what you need for the application to run? And this is the whole point of a container. It's, it's a way to have the best of both worlds, uh, isolation as much as you can, of course, because you still need to share the Linux kernel. See, there's only one operating system. There's only one kernel among all the uh, containers, while here the kernel is very individual, very, very specific to every virtual machine, which means also that here I can run Windows and Linux, Ubuntu, whatever, together, while here, all the containers, they have to share the same kernel, which means they have to run on the same version of Linux. Not the same operating system per se, operating system as in the kernel plus the user space files, because you can also, you can separate the uh, user space file per, per container. You can have a container with Red Hat, uh, Enterprise Linux, a container with Ubuntu, container with nothing at all, but just the, the kernel. 
that's fine, but they all share the same operating system, the same kernel, and you just need a container runtime to run this container. So containers are just uh, applications that run in their own, let's say, wall garden or uh, uh, special view of the world of the file system, but they share the same, uh, the same kernel. This is better because if you are careful, you get ex almost exactly the same isolation of a virtual machine, except for, of course, sharing the kernel, and much better use of your resources, which is crucial for modern applications. Is there any question or uh, missing something? Just let me know. So now we say, OK, this is what happened in around 2000, uh, what was it? 11? So, so why containers, why VMs, and why containers, or uh, compared to traditional uh, deployments, you need to have a reproducible execution environment. So this, you can snapshot it, you can copy it several times. It's not a ad hoc, it's very reproducible, and I'll show you how to, to create those, those containers with Docker files. And there's complete isolation between the, uh, the environments. And you don't need, so and why containers versus VMs? You don't need uh, to virtualize hardware. So you don't need to create like virtual devices, virtual RAM, virtual anything. It's all the same, uh, uh, the same resources, just divided across multiple containers. <coughs> and there are advantages like they run very fast, they, they, you can destroy them very fast as well, so you don't need to just throw away the entire virtual machine, and you don't need to boot an entire virtual machine with all that is necessary to boot a virtual machine, and they are almost like virtual machines, almost like. So this is the best uh, definition of a container, which is not, it's from uh, Alicia Goldfuss, Consider are processes, right? So you used Linux before, you know what a process is, right? So it's a, a piece of, a, it's a binary that runs on the kernel, that the kernel uh, executes uh, and can do things, can call the kernel, can do syscalls and interact with your, with your machine. So just processes. As you run a process, if you do ls or uh, run a daemon on your machine on the Linux host, exactly the same is a container. Bore from tarballs, so that container thing is just a glorified zip file. It's a tarball, so tar gz, but think of it as a big, big or small uh, archive of files. Anchor to namespaces controlled by C groups. So these are two concepts in Linux, which are namespaces and control groups. Right? So I, I don't need to go very deep into it, but it's a way for, a, for the Linux kernel to isolate a process into its own world, its own uh, fictional uh, view of the world. So a process, of course, if it runs in the same host, we'll see every other processes on the machine. But there's a way for the kernel, the PID namespaces, the process ID namespaces, to make that process believe is the only one on the host. And that's the whole point of a, that's how containers are, are actually uh, launched by the kernel, as in their own PID, process ID namespaces, and also in their own network namespace. So also, when you have multiple processes on the Linux, Linux is great, Unix actually, this comes from Unix. Unix started as a multi-user, multi-tenant operating system. Before, you know, like uh, the, the times of the ENIAC and stuff, there was only one person that could use a computer, like a, like a super, this, this big machines that occupied our entire room. Then they started to, become multi-users. Multiple users were starting to use the same machine at the same time. But that means there's some contention, some, uh, some uh, uh, 
contention of resources between people and processes. So that's why <coughs> from Unix we move to you know, Linux, and Linux is a multi-tenant operating system where the Linux kernel has to orchestrate resource allocation between multiple processes. So a very efficient way is to use namespaces and control groups. Control groups are just a feature of the Linux kernel that allows the kernel to say to one process, this what you can use, so in terms of RAM and CPU, of resources, and that's it, no more than that. And so when a process tries to, tries to exceed the allocated resources, the kernel will kill it or restart it or do something interesting. So the whole point of a container, just a process, no more, no less. So like, a, like a, any other process that runs on your machine, you can run a, a, a Linux, con Linux container. And the process is just in a jail, in a, in a s confined space. That's it. So that's, uh, that's the whole magic about containers is just this. So it's not, no, nothing really special. And Docker in 2011, I think, wait, there is, yes, in 2013, put together all these ideas into one nicely packed uh, package called Docker. And so you could do all this stuff without really going crazy about should I set, how do I set up my network namespace? How do I set, how do, how do I tarball these containers? Docker just make it easy for you. So, so C started from a long time ago, FreeBSD, Jail, Solaris Zones. They were early implementations of what I just talked about just now. Notably, Google, do, of course, Google being five years ahead of everybody else, even before Docker started thinking about these things, Google was already using containers, right? So actually, at, at, quite at the Google scale. So I think when Docker was coming out around that time, there was this announcement they were running, I don't know, like a two million containers a week or something like that. Every time you do a Google search, there's a little container that comes up, a process, of course, because you need to do something on, on a machine, so you need a process, but that process is containerized in Google. At least that's what we know, of course, because we, of course they, they were not very open about it, but definitely they, they told the world, hey, we're using containers for some time now, so here's some tips and tricks. Uh, and of course they contributed to LXC, they contributed to some technologies behind, the old Docker thing. So big thanks to Google because they realized this was not their uh, core business, of course. Their core business is the advertisement and searches, so why not giving back to the world open sourcing or contributing to, open, to already existing open source projects like C groups, uh, their, their knowledge. I remember being alive, of course, being in, in the industry around this time. It was quite, quite a thing, like uh, all developers I was working in a company, I was uh, leading a group, and all the developers, they were coming out to us like, uh, can, can we use this Docker thing because it's amazing and we just want to use it. I said, well, okay, let's see how it goes. In fact, like, it picked up quite, quite quickly. And you as a developer, you gotta know some containerization technology. So this is uh, now Docker has been synonymous to containers. We don't use the word Docker that much anymore because of course Docker is a company and then there are containers. For a while it's like, uh, it's become synonymous and now we are actually tr trying to be more careful when we talk, we say containers, right? So, but, and then Docker is a, it's a commercial, it's a, it's a corporation that does its own thing. So this started the container revolution, right? So, and the uh, adoption picked up quite fast, very fast, and uh, maybe too fast because, of course, like, uh, there are security implications of this. We have talked about it. But if you are not careful, you can let one container see and talk to another container or take over the host. And that's why in the beginning it was, ah, this Docker thing is not really secure, we need to be careful, of course, sure, but if you know what you're doing, you should be fine. So, so this evolved as well. 
uh, evolved, and now we are in a point where this became like the accepted industry standard to deploy, to package and deploy applications. So you write an application, your job is not done when you, you know, finish your last line of code. You need to put something extra, which is the containerization of applications. So that's why it's important to learn these uh, this, 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 this ideas. Of course, this is uh, something that we don't need to talk about now. So when you talk about containers, there are two things that you have to consider. So there's a running container, the actual container is running on, or your machine, or a bunch of servers in the cloud, anywhere you want. And then there's the image. So the, the container comes from an image, always comes from, a, from an image. The image is just this, this tarball zip file, which contains all the files, including the binary that is going to be executed when the container runs. Right, so this is the, the ideas behind the, uh, this is what Docker really did. Implementing a standard way, so defining the standard for containers, uh, container images. Implemented a registry. Question? Yeah, it, the question is if images is, a sort of snapshot. snapshot. It is a snapshot. So it is uh, a moment in time of a container. So you build a container by starting from a base image, and then you add some stuff, and then you snapshot it. Snapshot as you attach a label, you call it version 1.1, uh, and you push it to a registry. And that's a snapshot, as in uh, it, it doesn't contain any history, it's just the registry keeps track of what's going on in there. But yeah, it's just a collection of files, so you can call it a snapshot. In fact, you can take that, add more stuff, and take another snapshot, save it, and upload it, and that's another image. Similar and derived from the first one, but still a separate entity. So yeah, it is a kind of a snapshot. And so what Docker did, which is genius, open up like a public registry of images. Okay, that's, where, that's why it was really, was so easy now to exchange images because I just uploaded to Docker Hub. You, you got new stuff going on, you have a new version of whatever, just upload it. And this, the public registry was quite, quite the innovation in, in the industry in a way, right? So, Everybody started to, because it was free and you could just upload like a bunch of images, so people just started to upload crazy amount of images uh, for all sorts of things that everybody else in the world could just download them and run them. No instruction needed, just docker run, image, and the version. That's it. No complicated stuff, no uh, f tutorial to follow. If there's an image for anything, Apache and uh, uh, Java, whatever, Spark, you just download it and you know that more or less should be running. So this was the, the old revolution about, uh, about Docker. I'll skip this. So what are containers? Linux processes running in constrained environments. From the point of view of the process, the world ends at the boundaries set by the Linux kernel, which may or may not be the actual physical boundaries, probably not. It's something that the Linux kernel imposes on the process. So how constrained, uh, these are containers, of course, control groups, namespaces. Uh, so uh, there's a network namespace, which means if you, if you are not in a network namespace, you are in the network namespace of the host, you can see everything from the host. So all the Wi-Fi cars, network, everything. But if you are in a network namespace, you can only see your neighbors, your other processes in the network namespace. It's a, it's a, it's a way to isolate also net, networks for, for, uh, for processes. 
And so, of course, there is isolation in spaces, C groups. But it's not always great. It's totally, I mean, this is great, of course. It works almost all the time. So, of course, there is failure stories. People started to pull images without really understanding what they were doing, pulling always the latest tag. So tag is the version of the image. And then there is a, a meme in the industry, never pull the latest because you don't know. Uh, because people will replace it with new versions. So today you may run a version, version X, called latest. And tomorrow you pull the same image called application latest, and then you are all of a sudden you're running a new version. And you don't know, you didn't test it, you don't know if it's going to work or not. So this, as every powerful tool, you can also shoot yourself in the foot and be, be done with it. But, of course, 2020, 2013, 2014, things got very, very good for Docker, uh, the company, of course. Uh, they failed to monetize, so they went bankrupt a bunch of times, but it's, uh, they're still around. Uh, but they, they didn't really know how to monetize all this. Right? So uh, everybody thinks it was a wasted uh, opportunity for them. But of course, like, how do you monetize this? Then we can just talk about open source. Because this, all this is open source, right? So this, you don't need to pay a penny to Docker or any other company to use containers. Uh, you could pay Docker for the private registry and some more uh, space on the, of course, this, the, all these images, they occupy space, right? So uh, Docker, the company, was very gracious to pay for all these petabyte of Docker images that people were just uploading with no real uh, understanding to their servers. So it's, uh, you have to give it to them. They were very nice to the, to the community. And actually, they spring boot the, the whole industry. So great, there's some problems, OK, just uh, some a technology that's just born, always has problems. But then people started to adopt this thing in a way that was never seen before. So, and this is 2013, DevOps was probably, let's say, two, three years old, something like that. I mean, there was the very first DevOps conference in Belgium. I think it was 2009, so people say, oh, this DevOps thing goes so well with containers. We love it. We, we want to use more. But where do we run these containers? How do we run it? We got these problems. Uh, how do I scale this thing? Is it secure? Can I run it? Can I uh, make sure that it doesn't really uh, offer more attack surface to attackers? Can we? Uh, of course, can I monitor this stuff? Can I? Uh, most, most important, the scale was a problem. Because it works on my machine. I have Docker on my machine. Works great. I'm a developer. Uh, and then, uh, then I need to serve a lot of customers because my uh, application, of course, is awesome. Then the operation people have to have problems, right? So how do you coordinate many containers across multiple hosts? Guess who solved the problem? Google. Because Google was already working on these problems way before. There was a thing in Google called Borg from the Star Trek uh, thing. So you will be assimilated because everything in the end at Google seemed to be something related to containers. So, so they have this application called Borg, which was an orchestrator for running containers at scale in their data centers. Using Borg, they could see the data center as a one giant computer. So aggregating multiple hosts, multiple nodes into one giant supercomputer. You can just, you can just throw batch jobs, like, hey, run this uh, 10,000 containers of this kind. And uh, I don't care where they run. I just want to know that they run. right? So, so they got this thing called Borg and say, well, this is pretty cool. We, we, want to give it, we want to give it back to the community. We're not going to give Borg, of course. We're going to rewrite it. Uh, so three people at Google, uh, the three founding fathers. Unfortunately, there is no mother of Kubernetes, but uh, three guys, they, just, uh, they were working on the project. And then they, they published it on GitHub. Right? So one beautiful day, I think it was April. 
2015, there was a word. We put this on GitHub. Let's have fun, right? So that's that's how Kuber, this our open source project is born. Some people has to do the first commit. If you go to github.com slash kubernetes slash kubernetes, you can go back and see the very first commit, which was a working state of Kubernetes. I think it was version 0.4 or 5. So what it is, you get containers at scale, and you want to orchestrate them. You want to monitor them. You want to make sure that they run. You need an orchestrator. Kubernetes is exactly that. So, so now, Everything, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You got Kubernetes, everything looks like a container that can run on Kubernetes. Right? So it's as very simple as, uh, as that. So all the machines, Raspberry Pis, uh, or, uh, you know, OpenAI, ChatGPT, runs on Kubernetes. Imagine they have this huge fleet of machines in Azure, by the way, because Azure is one of the big founders of uh, OpenAI. How do they run this big machine learning model? They don't fit on one machine, of course. They need multiple GPUs. So they run, they orchestrate everything through Kubernetes. But that's only one example. We're going to talk about it. Uh, so these are the first people that really believed in it, uh, especially Red Hat and Google. Microsoft was late to the game, of course, uh, because at the beginning there was not much open source. I joined 2016. 2017 Microsoft, so that's where we started to really look into uh, this, this open source stuff and Kubernetes. So all these people together, they say, well, listen, this is uh, so cool. It's too, too good to be left to just a bunch of uh, volunteers on GitHub. So we need to create, we need to give some governance to the project. It cannot just be well, I want to contribute, here's, the, here's some code, right? So they, that's why these first founding members, they opened, they created the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which I'm going to talk about in, in a moment. So it's called Kubernetes. So don't pronounce it any, any ah, my new wife, she's Greek, so she, she told me how to pronounce it. So it's a Greek word. It says, um, that means um, Elsman, the guy, the person who steers the boat or the ship, um, because that's what he does. He steers, he orchestrates a bunch of uh, um, nodes into a fleet where you can run containers on top. Right, so it's a third generation because, of course, it's, it's been, this problem was there since for, for some time, right? So it's not like... Uh, all of a sudden, they discovered that they needed to orchestrate containers. So there was Mesos invented at Twitter a few years before, a uh, bunch of other stuff. Like uh, uh, even OpenShift was there, but doing something else. And then they, they look at Kubernetes and say, we're going to rebase OpenShift on Kubernetes because it's just uh, too cool to be, to, to be ignored. Started in June 2014. And immediately, uh, started to, you know, be an ecosystem, right? So because there's a lot of development going on. So this is the uh, history. So they started Borg and they, I don't know, we don't know what they run now, but definitely not Kubernetes for their own stuff. But they do offer, Kuber Google offer Kubernetes to the world. And so now it has its own uh, life. You can see pretty consistent. Every three months, there's a new version. So it's a very, uh, the community came together, said this is a, a great project that needs a lot of innovation. So the release cycle of Kubernetes is three months. So every three months, expect a new version. Uh, they only slowed down for COVID. They went to four months, and then they went back to three months after uh, when the, the emergency was over. Now, of course, because this Lots of interest. It's pretty stable, right? So even if you release every three months, doesn't mean that you are breaking with the past, right? So uh, releases are retro compatible. Usually there is no breaking changes on the API. So sure, you should upgrade, uh, but don't worry if you don't, because usually 
the, the versions are pretty stable, but they only support it for a year. So the community Kubernetes, uh, if you look for support in the community, of course, don't expect SLA, don't expect like uh, people waking up in the middle of the night to, to help you out. But because it's worldwide, probably somebody is awake to help you out. Uh, but only three versions before, so about a year before. So today, we are at 127, 128 is about to be released. And so 125 is the oldest version you should be running. Nobody's gonna tell you anything if you run an older version, but for the community, that's, that's the agreement. So what are the principles behind Kubernetes, right? So how do you orchestrate 10,000 containers, a million containers, over 5,000 machines. It's not a trivial task. It's a distributed software. So it's a distributed model for orchestrating containers. One thing that is really behind the whole idea of Kubernetes is uh, the idea of a state machine. I don't know if you are into engineering. I mean, not software engineering. My brother is an actual engineer, like a electrical engineer, so he, is, uh, he taught me the principle of engineering, and software engineering is not, is not yet um, a craft. It's just, uh, it's just something you do, but there's an actual discipline called engineering, and there's a thing about that is called the state, um, state machines, where you have a state, and in, in Kubernetes we, call, we talk about the desired state, and the actual state of the, of, the, of the world, of the system, right? So this is behind almost everything in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is just a, a, recon a big reconciliation loop for states. So, uh, and maybe I have something else. Okay, I'll come back to this concept in, in a moment. So at the Declarative versus imperative model, where you declare a state versus um, imposing a state. We don't have a whiteboard, too bad. But imagine that you want to perform some task, right? So like running a container on a machine. What you can do is to tell the machine, run this, run this container. You can be nice and say please, but the machine, you just give instructions to the container runtime or whatever on, on the host to run this container. And that's an imperative way to approach the problem, right? So you are imposing, executing commands. It works, but it's a bit brittle. Somebody else comes and kills my container. How do I know? Am I aware that this is still running? It's really not resilient. Kubernetes uh, takes this the other way around. It just says, hey, I would like the state to be I, this container with this image version running in X copies. I don't know, I don't care how you want to do it. Uh, it doesn't matter for the user. It just, the user just declares a state, which is a, like a particular uh, state of the world, or, or the, 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 the cluster state, which runs this, and with these ports, and so on. Kubernetes, the API server, the, the brain behind Kubernetes, look at the, your desire, and looks at the current state of the cluster, compares them, computes the differences, and then applies your, your changes, applies enough commands and uh, changes, so the current state of the cluster reconciles, gets closer and closer to the, current, to the de desired state. And that's the whole point of a con reconciliation loop. And this is the genius behind Kubernetes. It's this very powerful concept in software engineering, in uh, distributed systems, where you have two states, and when they are when they co coincide, everybody's happy, Kubernetes doesn't, has done its job, and it can rest un until either you change the desired state or the actual state of the cluster changes, and then makes a 
makes, uh, triggers a signal for Kubernetes to change things. This is how, also how biological system work, right? So the feedback system, you do something, there is a, so there's a tendency towards a state, and sometimes the, the actual system deviates from that, and there's some mechanism to bring it back where it should be. <clears throat> so this is declarative versus uh, um, imperative. Let's look it up, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So 100% so open source, so all these things are completely open, free, nobody should charge for using Kubernetes, but of course like uh, in the cloud you can use it if you pay for the resources you need. Uh, supports multiple container runtimes, runs everywhere. Uh, from the smallest chip or SOC system on a chip to like big open AI, big clusters, there's even uh, uh, was a keynote in Valencia, Kubecon, I think Huawei put it on a, on a satellite, shoot it to space, so runs in space. The um, US Air Force puts Kubernetes on F-16 fighter jets, and they run, so pretty, pretty easy, and uh, it's pretty resilient. Everywhere, cloud, bare metal. I have a cluster at home, there's a, probably a cluster in my laptop running now, so, so that's, uh, uh, that's, how, that's how it works. So, took it from, from this grid side. So it's nothing magic, it's just a bunch of stuff, right? So running on, on nodes, right? A node is, a, is a most likely a Linux machine, can be any, can be ARM, can be Intel, any other architectures are there? Well, <laughs> these are the two most, most common architecture for, for chips. So all this stuff can run on, uh, on, uh, on different uh, uh, nodes. So there's a master, also we don't call it master anymore because it's uh, offensive apparently. So it used to be master and slave, but it's very sensitive names. So we call them control plane and uh, nodes or workers. Um, workers could be also be offensive to somebody, but anyway. Uh, so the master run is the brain of Kubernetes, right? So it's the logic, all these reconciliation loops, all the things that mix a Kubernetes cluster, a Kubernetes cluster runs on the, uh, the control plane. Doesn't need to run on their own node. You can take all those services and run them on a worker node, doesn't matter. As long as they are running and they are fine and they have enough resources to run, you should be fine. So the API server is what really you interact with when you talk to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is, your, is the API server. So it's just an API, so it's, uh, uh, it's stateless. It's a REST API, by the way. So you talk to Kubernetes through HTTP protocol. Right, so you make a request with some payload to a specific path. The API server will take your request, authenticate you, check your identity, are you who you pretend you are, can you do what you want to do, and if it all checks out, they say, okay, I'm gonna do what you what you asking, right? So I'm gonna, uh, for example, run your application or open a service or do something else. Uh, there's a scheduler, so the scheduler clearly is what the API server doesn't have a scheduler inside of it, so the, there's an external service called scheduler, which has a simp very simple job. Uh, the API server says, hey, I want to run this container, this uh, application, and I need uh, 10 gigabyte. Is there a host with 10 gigabyte free then the scheduler will just say, yeah, that's the one, and then the IP server will just take the information, run the, uh, contact the host, and run the, the container over there. And the controller manager is actually a very specialized piece of software. All, all these are, with, are written in Go. Right, so just go to Kubernetes, Kubernetes, there's actually the source code. Uh, and it's not really crazy, difficult to understand, it's just a thing that stays there, sits there, 
watches for events and then does something with it. It's a reconciliation loop. How would you write a recon reconciliation loop? There's just a, a function in Go. I don't know if you know Golang, but it's, it's, really, it's not too difficult to understand. Just a, a piece of code that watches for something, and when something happens, does something else. Right, so it's, it's very, sounds more than, uh, than it is. Now, all this, of course, needs some state. So the services themselves, the API server is stateless, doesn't contain any state in itself, so the code doesn't store any, anything locally, everything is stored in a database. A TCD, just a database. So it's a, specifically is a key value store. Uh, in a TCD, everything, so it's not like a SQL, uh, transactional database is more like a MongoDB, if you know it. Uh, so everything is a JSON object in ATCD. It's pretty much like MongoDB, just a different, uh, it was born in different times, and uh, uh, but they share the same idea that every, everything in uh, ATCD, like in MongoDB, is a document. Document is just a bunch of JSON. So just a JSON document. So all these things, a pod, um, a service, they are just objects into, in, in a, CT, a TCD database. It's the, it was the best at the time, still historically the database for Kubernetes. Uh, so here we are, this is a cluster. You can build yourself, if you have just three old PCs lying around, or you can ask one of the clouds to uh, give, build it for you. In a minute, you ask Google Cloud, you get a cluster with a bunch of uh, master nodes and a bunch of worker nodes, the size you want. Uh, you need GPUs, great, you just pay and you can get anything you want. Or if you are brave, you just build this yourself. And of course, look on the, on the, Kubernetes, on the worker nodes, there's, of course, like a kubelet, which talks to the API server and execute all the commands. Kube proxy will leave it. But what's important is the container runtime, Docker, it's to simplify. It's not Docker anymore, but it's like Docker. It's called container D, it's called Podman, doesn't matter. In fact, it's a container runtime. It's something that runs containers. That's it. So, Definitely don't, not Docker, as in the, the, the same Docker runs on your machine, but in the end, it's, all, it's a system that runs containers for you. That's it. Any question? I know they're going so fast, yes? So the systems should be consistent, so they should be same version of the same operation system for the nodes? The, yeah, yeah, so... Um, API server, of course, these are all version uh, components. So API server version 1.27 can work with Kubelet 1.26 and 25 and 24. So usually the versions of the, compo of the components, they should be the same. That's, that's the ideal situation. So you can have an API server on 1.27 and then uh, the other two can also be 1.27. So the, the control plane should be at the same version. But the worker nodes, they are allowed to be, I think, minus three, minus two version behind the control plane. And that's okay. You mean of Kubernetes or, of oper or operation system? You mean on the underlying operation? So uh, as far as I understand it, so the, um, on nodes, it would be Linux installed? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, on top of this Linux, it would be kind of environment, uh, Kubernetes? Yeah which will uh, kind of connect these resources of the node into the main uh, yeah. kind of infrastructure. Yeah. Yes. So in this case, the resources which shared should be the same kind of. In this case, Linux versions should be like exactly the same. For example, if you run like, uh, uh, like here Debian and here you run uh, like uh, Nothing stops you. To, that's okay, that's okay. As long as uh, this Kubelet, Kubelet is just a go binary, right? So. It runs anywhere, all sorts of distributions. For consistency, of course, you probably don't want to run 
wildly different uh, version of Linux everywhere because of course it, it's for you. You have to maintain different version of Linux, probably not what you want, but nothing stops you from running a node with Ubuntu and a node with RHEL. But at some point it can be undefined behavior or it would be consistent in like, for example, like very different, like here you have Windows, here you have like Linux, then they cannot share together some resources. Well, is it like downloaded somewhere and uh, have available or is just not compatible and you need no, to No, actually, actually, and if you go to Azure, you can ask a cluster, one cluster with different node operating system. So you can have a, a mixed cluster of Linux and Windows, no problem. It's but uh, um, how, how the shared resources, they kind of... Um, so it works like this. Compatible. So let's say that this is Linux and this is Windows, right? When you schedule an application, the, open, the, the API server will recognize that one needs a Windows host and one needs a Linux host and will just send them to different hosts. Okay, so in this case, if I run in Linux application and I have, for example, Windows node and Linux node, they always would be run on the Linux node. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so it, it's it, not it, possible to make them compatible because I thought that maybe it would be idea behind the Docker that it's also can kind of eliminate this inconsistency somehow automatically. Yeah, within the same kernel, within the same... Uh, so they, they should be kind of... Opening system. So much. yes, indeed, you can run a Ubuntu container on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, host. That's okay, or Alpine. Because or they have some bin, same bin folder, actually. Yeah, the, the point is, uh, a Windows container needs a Windows kernel, which is not available on a Linux, no, Linux node. Nobody figured this out yet, how to run uh, Linux. Uh, so they, they, are definitely, they are different kernels, so they cannot, you cannot run them. Okay. But yeah, definitely, so this can be a mix. <laughs> so I thought that maybe like it's the next stage or something. So in theory, you can do the just uh, unification of the computational power. It's kind of like mining or mm -hmm. some GPU like research things. So you can just uh, get some random hardware, but uh, at some point the software installed on this hardware unify this kind of kind of API or like yeah. Nvidia CUDA. Yeah, or this like does this. it to a certain extent already, but not okay, because this can be different machines, uh, 8 gigabyte of RAM, uh, one, 200 gigabyte of RAM, it doesn't matter. For, so Kubernetes pull it together. Okay. But it has some limitations. <coughs> it's not perfect yet. There's also, uh, there are new things on the block like kata containers, uh, micro VMs. There are technologies that abstract even more uh, these, these containers, but it's not exactly around the corner. I mean, it's not for everybody. It's also a way to have more isolation called uh, confidential computing. So that absolutely this pod is in a, is, which is a container, which I completely isolated from the rest. So there's no way from the host to read anything from this pod. So they are, they are of course, it, it never stops innovating, of course, right? So there's new use cases like banking and, uh, more confidential computing that requires new technology, which is around the corner, so pretty, it's getting adopted now. So the sure. co containers is, um, in this case, containers, they also some have some predefinition kind of, for example, some containers, they can be run on like some kind of node. So it's not, yeah. not yeah. on the like virtual machine, you can run it on any hardware, for example, you can, uh, copy like from Windows to Linux and then j just same like v VDMI, VMDI or? Yeah, like well, for example, if I'm running a machine learning model, I'm telling Kubernetes, well, this container will benefit from having a GPU, right? So then the scheduler will look at all the nodes and say, do I have a GPU available somewhere? Yes or no, make a decision. You can also say, if there is no GPU, don't run it. Or you can say, if there is no GPU, run it anywhere, anyway, because I prefer my job to run than not to run, even slow, 
because it'd be much lower without the GPU. But depends on your resources, right? So uh, maybe if there is no GPU available, the scheduler will spin up a new node with the GPU so you can run the, the, the workload. It's very flexible. The pla it's a platform, right? So you can just uh, mangle it according to, your, uh, to what you need. But, yeah. Yes, yes, you can influence the scheduler. So can you influence the scheduler? Yes, you can. Uh, the scheduler is also pluggable, and the scheduling algorithm is very, very known. It's very kind of, like, you can read very simply what it does, uh, what, pri what prioritize before, uh, before making a decision. And you can also plug in a new, so there's actually a very interesting new thing. Uh, I'm part of, also part of this effort called, uh, within CNCF, they are the technical advisory groups, TAG. Uh, there's a TAG called, there's a TAG for security, observability. There's one called environmental sustainability, right? So what if the scheduler could be aware of, we call it the carbon intensity of your workloads? So say, well, it's a, Every morning, uh, there's, there's sunlight, and so there's a lot of uh, solar power available, which, which is low carbon intense, right? So it, it produces less CO2. So I would probably, the scheduler can be aware and say, oh, I'm gonna schedule it on uh, whatever, these, these machines that are solar powered, instead of this other machine that is, I don't know, uh, carbon, uh, 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 fossil fuel power. So there's a way actually to influence the scheduler decision based on whatever you like. So in this case, somebody made a carbon aware scheduler where can, there's a way of what's going on and what your data centers are uh, consuming in or producing in terms of uh, CO2. All right, no more questions, so let's move on. So what it is, so there's always APIs, and this is how the current state matches the desired state through a series of loops, uh, which is really the, the whole point of uh, Kubernetes. And it's modular, modular. So that's what really made the difference between Kubernetes and the bunch of other uh, orchestrators out there, the plugins, that Kubernetes was very extensible. Everybody could write, a new object type or uh, could write a plugin for the scheduler or for uh, the API server, extending the API of the core Kubernetes into something else. So and people started to go crazy about it and that's why I think it's one of the reasons why it was so, so popular. So this is the uh, unit of computation in Kubernetes. So we talk about containers, how come that now you talk about pods? Well, this is one abstraction that the authors or the ideators of uh, Kubernetes started to think. Uh, what if a unit of computation, not just a container, but a collection of containers, right? So because sometimes I need uh, um, some um, pattern. So C1, for example, is my main application. So my Java container with my Java application or my whatever, Golang or whatever. But then I need some ancillary or sidecars to help my application to run smoothly. For example, C2 could be a, con a container that does git clone something or does the for initializing a database. So running some SQL statement to prepare my database so my main application can find some data there. Something like that, so, or some validation of some external endpoint, something like that. So in their wisdom, they, they figure out, like uh, instead of having one pod, one container, one pod, let's make a more like a one-to-many relation. So one pod is one unit of computation but inside the pod, there can be any number of containers. 
really, there is no limit. Of course, like, uh, you don't see more than two, three, sometimes four, <coughs> but usually most of the pods you will find, they have one container, that's just fine, but you know you have the option, you have the possibility to add more containers in the same pod so they can do more things together. Uh, of course, the containers, they share the same network. So this, because this is a network namespace, and you go back to the, oh, I can do this. You can go back to the uh, Linux kernel capabilities. So there is a network namespace that includes all the three containers. They share the same IP address. They share everything about the network, all the containers in a pod. They share the same volume, so sometimes you need to add persistent storage uh, to your application because they need to store data, store configuration. They share it between the, the containers, but they still like indivisible unit of computations. You can, if you have a pod with three containers, you can't run them one on a machine and two on another one. It has to be on the same machine. So if the old pod needs 10 gigabytes of RAM and you have a machine with seven and a machine with three available, the pod cannot be scheduled because you don't have a machine with 10 gigabytes free because they all need to be together. They cannot be split. So there's a, that's the, the idea behind it's because it's an atomic unit. So you start with a single pod, probably want to add some storage or multiple containers or volumes. Volume can be config, config maps, like a configuration files or secrets as well. So we'll talk about it quickly. So you can have multiple pods. So these are identical copies of the same pod each with his own IP address and kind of stamped one after the other. So, so the, the, there's a template, the pod template, which is repl replicated n times uh, in a replica set. So this a replica set is a different ob is a, an, ob an object in itself, and the object contains or is like a child, uh, father-child relationship. So the pod belongs to the replica set and the replica set as children, which are the pods. So that's, uh, that's how, it's a, it's a handy concept in Kubernetes to have a replica set, because then you can, if you delete the replica set, you delete all the pods in it. Instead of deleting, for example, deleting or creating uh, 10 pods with 10 different operations, you can say, I want a replica set, this is the template, and I want 10 copies and Kubernetes will just do it for you. We'll just pin up 10 pods uh, without, uh, without a problem. And then there's a higher level object called deployment, which contains a replica set. So a replica set is a child of deployment. And in this case, I'm not gonna go into details, but uh, a deployment can have multiple, multiple replica set, which means that you can use the deployment, which is really what you're gonna do as a developer, probably write a deployment for your application, which contains a pod template, right? So with your image, with your ports, configuration, blah, 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 but then embedded in a deployment object, because that makes it easy for operation, operators to use your deployment template and, uh, and run your application. So these are deployment replica set. So of course there are services. What is the point of having a good application if you don't expose it to the world? Again, like this will make you go crazy if you have to do it for 10 different machines because you have to coordinate the IP addresses. Kubernetes does it for you because you can control every machine in the cluster, expose the port, do some magic with IP tables. It's don't need to know all this, but it's all about exposing your application to the outside world. Config map, secret, so no application is standalone. You always need to influence the behavior of your application through configuration, right? So a key somewhere in a file, some uh, connection string to a 
database, how do you give it to the application, but keeping it a secret. So Kubernetes is an object called secrets that can contain these secrets and be given to the application. And the application can use them as environment variables or as a file uh, in different ways, so different mechanisms. So I'm going very quick, of course, I'll be happy to give you like a all day long uh, introduction to Kubernetes with also hands on. Persistent volumes, of course, you do need sometimes. So Kubernetes was born mostly for stateless microservices, where you store the, the state somewhere outside the cluster, but nothing stops you from storing the state in the cluster on persistent volumes. So this has been done, it's very, very common now to have, for example, a database running in Kubernetes. It's not, not, not impossible. You gotta be careful because you, because you may delete everything by accident, but if you are careful, you know how to replicate the volumes, back, back them up, that's totally fine and totally safe. Of course, skip, so now. So, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. All this, great, amazing, then people jump on the boat, of course, and they say, oh, this is uh, so important, we can, can't just leave it to vendors, right? So we can't just let a bunch of commercial interest guide the evolution of Kubernetes. Otherwise, uh, I don't want to name names, I say, oh, this is mine, uh, I just decide that this is the feature we want to implement, and that's not how uh, good open source works. So there's a open source and it's pseudo open so or open uh, code. So for example, there are projects out there that are on GitHub. You can read all the code, you can copy it, you can fork it, and it's great, but it's not exactly open source if one company controls, uh, for example, the, the pull request uh, approver. All the approvers work for one company. It's not really open source. Yeah, it's open code that you can read, but you have no way to influence the roadmap and no community around it, then uh, there's not really open source. So, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was born to manage the project. In the beginning, it was only Kubernetes, right? So there was one project, very simple, lots of people contributing. You have to have some governance, right? So uh, some rules. Right, so who has access to the code? Who can approve changes? What's the process of proposing new changes? In Kubernetes, there's a very, very well-established process called the CAP, the Kubernetes, Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal. So you can write your, uh, your idea on some, in GitHub. You say, hey guys, uh, hey people, I have this idea, and then people vote, and uh, if it gets quorum, then it gets uh, approved. So it started with Kubernetes, and then other projects jump in. They say, oh, there's Prometheus. Prometheus say, oh, we have this amazing monitoring tool called Prometheus, born in Sun Cloud in Berlin, and they say, mm, this is getting more and more popular. Let's donate the project to CNCF, so CNCF will take care of the governance of the project. So, and then it grew to 154 projects. So that's uh, over seven, eight years of life. Uh, yeah, yeah, six or seven years, yeah, I think. Uh, and there are 12 million contributions. Uh, so this is amazing, right? So imagine one company that had 200,000 developers. There is no such a thing. So these people together, people that live in different time zones all over the world, they speak different languages, but they still contribute to the same projects as one uh, pool of developers. So, the CNCF also does interesting things like the landscape, the cloud native landscape. This is what the picture everybody puts on the slides to scare people away because like, there's so much stuff out there, well, I don't understand. It's okay, most of these things, you don't need to choose them all or you, I don't even know all of them. Uh, but you can, the idea is that you can pick, pick and choose what, you, what's your, what, what you need for your project. So you need a registry, there's Arbor and there's this other guy and this other 
project, uh, then you can try a bunch of them and see what is best for you. And same for uh, security, container runtimes, somewhere, so much. <laughs> uh, so container runtime, you have container D, which is a CNCF project, but you also have CRAO, which is not a CNCF project, but it's still on the map because it's open source and it's made by Red Hat, by the way. So, and you got other runtime that are not per se owned or managed by the foundation, but still uh, valid alternatives to, um, to build a cloud native application. So these are the uh, graduated projects, which is, so there's a incubation, uh, wait, the sandbox, incubation, and graduation. So graduated projects are the ones that are totally production ready. So Kubernetes, of course, Prometheus, definitely, a uh, bunch of other stuff, uh, Containerd, Envoy, Service Proxy. So these are very stable, very, very uh, accepted standards to run stuff, right? So if you need a SQL database in the cloud, in Kubernetes, Vitesse, for example, is one, play, one place to look, <coughs> and so on. So these are very stable communities behind them. They're all CNCF projects. They are a great place to start. Uh, if you want to contribute, you don't need to contribute to Kubernetes. Of course, it's great. It would be great if you do, but there's so much out there. Most of this stuff is written in Golang, ad admittedly. But, but there's chances for, uh, for uh, other languages as well. And then, of course, like, uh, these are the crazy stuff, like uh, the sandbox uh, project where you don't have, um, sorry, the, the incubated project, the incubated. Uh, getting there, a project in incubation, a project means the community around it, like the maintainers, these actual people behind every one of them, right? So there's people every day contributing, replying to GitHub issues, making sure that the project is successful. So these people behind uh, whatever, DAPR. So I think we think our community, our project is mature enough, we apply for graduation, right? So it just, they open a pull request, they open a, yeah, a GitHub issue actually, uh, and then a process starts that people vote uh, there's a TOC, a technical oversight committee in the CNCF, which has binding votes. They actually decide if a project is mature enough to go to the next stage. For example, DAPR to be graduated, they have, they have to go through a security review, uh, do diligence process that says, okay, this is how many contributors we have, we are not dead. We have an active, vibrant community behind. So every, of, every one of these projects has to go through some. There's a process, so it's, it's very fair to every project. Um, so why would you like to, what, would you want to donate your open source project to CNCF? Because then you get the backing of a huge organization. By the way, the CNCF is a daughter foundation of the Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation is the one that manages Linux, the kernel. Uh, the kernel and everything around the kernel, so not the distributions, so it's not cano it doesn't manage Ubuntu or uh, Red Hat, uh, Enterprise Linux, but the Linux Foundation manages the Linux kernel and a bunch of other projects, of course, in and then there are sub-foundations, like uh, the Hyperledger Foundation and the uh, other foundation that manage other projects, and one of them is the CNCF. So you are now into this big ecosystem of open source with years of experience managing large projects, small projects, doesn't matter. So it's a, it's a way to make your project thrive. We grow, we grow, we grow, 20, 23 members, of course. So members are vendors, the Microsoft and the Google of the world, and then the end users are Uber and uh, Picnic and uh, Booking.com, these people that they use, they use Kubernetes, they use all the technologies behind cloud native, but they don't profit out of it. They just, they are end users. And these are also growing 
pretty fast. Amsterdam, April 2023, 10,000 people in Rai. It's the largest, uh, I think it's the largest tech conference in Europe so far, 10,000 people. It was very busy, I, I can tell you. Uh, I was there somewhere, uh, of course, um, uh, because I'm an ambassador, of course, it's my, it, it was also very personal because they were coming in Amsterdam in 2020, in April, just, uh, and then two months before, they closed down the whole planet. And so this was like our dream interrupted for three years. And now we finally had it. It was glorious, it was sunny. Actually, it was raining a couple of days, but you know, it's, it's what you remember is the sunny day, the first day. So, so it was great. So it's a community. So it's just made of people like me, like you, like a, just a bunch of uh, people in a room or a virtual room coding and writing documentation, organizing meetups or conferences. So this is what we organize in Amsterdam. I think some of you had free tickets to this, right? Was there anybody there? Ah, too bad. We had so much fun. 10, I, uh, we, but uh, we're gonna come back, so you're always very welcome to, to join because it's uh, just like two days, but it's a two days conference. Great, great party, we had a great party because, I mean, so. <laughs> uh, um, this is just two days in a year full of meetups. So this is what we organized, we did it uh, last week, I think, a couple of weeks ago. We're coming back in June and in July, so every month we organize a meetup. But this could be a place where we can organize a meetup. You wanna be, so, personal story, 10 years ago, maybe 11 at this point, uh, I was in between jobs. Like one, one of the few times I was in between jobs and then uh, 10 years ago there was no, DevOps was still, you know, the first Belgium conference was just started. And I decided, oh, you know what, I'm bored, I'm gonna start a meetup. The, Amsterdam DevOps meetup. That kind of changed my career. Like a, it was like a thing, a thing that I, I, I didn't even pay much attention to. It. Just, ah, I'm just gonna do this. But then I start organizing meetups and I be, became like a center of DevOps uh, talks in this community. We organized DevOps days in Amsterdam, it was great. I met a lot of people and my career just changed like a completely transformed by being an active part of a community. So you wanna organize a meetup, be my guest because I'm getting old and uh, there's, uh, there's always more to do, right? So um, you don't need to do this, of course, you can organize C++ meetup, whatever. Uh, and anything that makes you excited about technology, share it, that's the whole, uh, whole uh, message. So what do you need to start? What do you need to start? You need your application, you need Docker or your machine, start containerizing and just put in a Kubernetes cluster. So, and reach out to me or uh, to the community. We have a Slack, uh, so CNCF is a Slack. I'm always there. There's a Netherlands um, um, channel, slack.cncf.io. And we, me and other bunch of people, they, they, we all, always hang out there. Or I'm also in the Codem Slack, if you like, but that's where the community is, in the, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, Slack. So, not much to, more to say, uh, one hour and a half, so I think we did pretty okay. Any questions? And thank you, just in Italian. I sometimes hear the sort of saying, you don't need Kubernetes, that uh -huh. too many people are using it. Yes. What is your thought yes. on that? Yes, so this is classic. I mean, somebody's successful, then there's the detractors, right? So mm -hmm. that's normal, that's okay. We as a community, we also have large shoulders. We, we can take some heat. Sure, you don't need Kubernetes for everything. And nobody said anything, I mean, only, 
crazy person would say, you know, you, you have to run everything on Kubernetes. It doesn't make any sense. These things, like, you, it's like saying you have to code everything Golang or uh, whatever. No, it's it, these tools, there are tools better suited for different kind of jobs. That said, Kubernetes is a very open platform, so you can massage it and uh, change it and make it so you can run a lot of stuff on it. So, for example, serverless. It's been, I've been hearing is the year of serverless for since uh, some time. Uh, it, of course, obviously, is a. It makes sense for a lot of use cases, but then. How many serverless developers do you know? And how many Kubernetes developers do you know? There's so, so many more consideration to guide your adoption choices, right? So what I see is like a lot of, also consider this. So you, you get a problem with Kubernetes online, there's like you're gonna be drowned in blog posts, uh, tutorials. So you can find information anywhere you want. For a, another container orchestration or another technology, the, the communities exist, but they are much smaller. So it's a quite the consideration, I think. So yeah, it's not for everything, but for a lot of, lot of things, uh, it's good enough. Thank you.